Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Storm's Garden again. We're going to be going over Chapter 2 of Teeming with Microbes. Let's go ahead and get this show on the road. Thank you for coming on and hanging out. We've gotten through the foreword, we've gotten through the preface, and we have read Chapter 1. Today is Chapter 2. If you have a copy, go ahead and read along with me. Chapter 2, Classic Soil Science. <clears throat> this would be a good time to go outside and get a few handfuls of soil from different places in your yard. Take a good look. Close. Look at the soil. Smell it. Grind some between your fingers. Compare the samples for differences and similarities when you repeat those observations after you read. This, when you repeat those observations after you read, this chapter will have a different perspective of what is in your hands. The typical gardener knows very little about soil and why it matters. To us, however, soil is the house in which all organisms of the soil food web, soil food web live. It is a stage for the actors that interest us. You simply have to know something about the physical nature of soil if you are to understand the biology that inhabits it and how to use the biology to become a better gardener. After all, an acre of good soil teems with life, containing several pounds, about one kilogram of small mammals, 133 pounds of protozoa, 900 pounds each of earthworms, arthropods, and algae, 2,000 pounds of bacteria and 24,000 pounds of fungi. Wow. Most of us, if we want things to grow better, simply replace soil that is poor in quality with good soil. Experienced gardeners know good soil when they see it. Coffee, colored, rich in organic matter, able to hold water yet still drain when there is too much around. And it smells good. Poor soil is pale, compacted, drains either too well or won't in retain any water or hold too much water, sometimes even becoming anaerobic. It can smell bad. If you are going to use the soil food web, however, you really need to know more. Where does soil come from? What are its components? How can we agree to, to describe it? And how can we measure its characteristics? This knowledge will help you adjust your soils for what deter for what determines really good soil. In the end, is what you wish to grow in it. This knowledge will help you to adjust your soils for what it de for what de determines really good soil. In the end, is what you wish to grow in it. Okay. Good soil must be able to maintain a soil food web capable with the plants it supports. Trust us. In the end, you will be glad to know a little something more about soil, something beyond its color and smell. What is soil, really? Technically, soil is all those loose, un unconsolidated, unconsolidated mineral and organic matter in the upper layer of the Earth's crust. The standard comparison uses an apple to represent the earth carve off approximately 75 percent of the skin which represents all the water and another 15 percent which represents deserts and mountains land too hot or cold or wet or steep to be able to for, be uh, to be usable for growing plants the 10 percent that remains represents all the earth's soil soils with the necessary physical chemical and biological properties to support plant life when we take into account the footprints of cities, roads, and other man-made infrastructures, these inaccessibly unusually are sited on some of the very best soils. Oh no. The surface area of usable soil is further reduced. For the moment, the thing that concerns us is the tiny strip of apple skin that represents the soil in our gardens and yards. How did it get there? What is it? Why does it support plant growth? Weathering, weathering, <laughs> weathering. Your yard's soil 
is in large part of a product of weathering. Weathering is the sum impact of all the natural forces that decay rocks. These forces can be physical, chemical, or biological. To begin, the more action of wind, rain, snow, sun, and cold, along with glacial grindings, bump rocks, bumps along riverbeds, scrapes against rocks and soils and oceans, waves and streams and currents, physically breaks down into tiny mineral particles, <laughs> tiny mineral particles, and starts the process of soil formation. Water freezes in rock cracks and crevices and expands, increasing the volume by 9% and, and exerting a force of about 2,000 pounds per square inch as it turns, as it turns to ice. Hot weather causes the surface of rocks to expand, while the inner rock just a millimeter away contains cool remains cool and stable as the outer layers pull away cracks from the surface peels off into smaller particles chemical weathering dissolves rocks by breaking the molecular bonds that hold it together through exposure to water oxygen car and carbon dioxide some materials in rock go into solution causing the rock to lose structural stability and making it more susceptible to physical weathering. Think of a sugar cube dropped into a cup of tea, then stirred. Fungi and bacteria also contribute to chemical weathering by producing chemicals as they decay their food. Fungi produce acids, bacteria, alkaline substances. Besides carbon dioxide, microbes produce ammonia and nitric acids which act as solvents. Rock mineral is broken down into simpler elements, although there, although there are about 90 different chemical elements in soil. Only eight constitute a, major, a majority. Oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, manganese, calcium, sodium, and potassium. <clears throat> all, all have an electric charge on a molecular level, and in different combinations, these form these form electrically charged molecules that combine to form different minerals. <coughs> Boop. Uh. The acids produced by the yellow lichen on this rock are slowly contribute to its conversion into soil. So that is a fungus on that rock right there. Biological activity too causes weathering. Mosses, lichen, or more precisely the fungi in them, attach themselves to rocks and produce acids and chelating 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 uh, agents that dissolve little bits of rock to use as nutrients, <clears throat> resulting in small fissures that fill up with water, freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw cycles further break apart the parent materials, and the roots of larger plants penetrate crevices and widen them, forcing rocks apart. <clears throat> Organic matter. Weathering breaks rocks down into materials, into material components of one sort or another. Soil, however, needs to be able to support plant life, and that requires more than just minerals. On average, good garden soil is about 45% mineral and nature and 5% organic matter, <clears throat> built up as organisms above and in it go about their daily business organic matter built up as organisms above and in it go about their daily business. As plants and animals on the surface die and are decayed by bacteria and fungi, they are ultimately converted into humus, a carbon-rich coffee-colored organic material. Think of the end product of composting. This viable material is humus. Humus contains a very large, hard-to-break chain of carbon molecules which a large, with a large surface area. These surfaces carry electrical charges, which attract and hold mineral particles. What's, 
What's more, the molecular structure of the long chains resembles... Wait. <clears throat> What's more... The molecular structure of the long chains resembles a sponge. Lots of nooks and crannies that serve as uh, variable condominium, condominiums for soil microbes. Once you've added humus or other organic matter, such as dead plant matter and insect bodies to weathered materials, you have a soil almost compatible of supporting trees, shrubs, lawns, gardens, but not quite. Air and water. Minerals and humus make up the solid phase of soil, but plants require oxygen and water, the gaseous and liquid phase as well. The voids between individual minerals and organic particles are filled by air or water, and sometimes both. Humus is a rich coffee colored and full of or and is full of organic material. This handful is about 55% organic material. Very black. <clears throat> and sometimes both. Oh yeah, we're going to look at the triangle today. Nice. <clears throat> what moves between soil pore spaces in one of two... Wait, water moves between soil pore spaces in one of two ways. By the pull of gravity or by the pull of individual water molecules on each other or capillary action. Gravitational water moves freely through soil... Picture water being poured into a jar of gravel. Gravity pulls the water to the bottom of the jar as the jar fills up. Large pores promote the flow of gravitational water as the water fills the pores. It displaces and pushes out the air in front of it. When the water flows through, it allows a new supply of air to move in. When gravitational water hits roots, which acts like a sponge, it is absorbed. When gravitational water hits roots, which is which act like sponges, it is absorbed. <clears throat> Smaller soil pore spaces contain a film of capillary water that is not influenced by gravity and is actually left behind after gravitational water passes through. The liquid is bonded together by the attraction of its molecules for each other, a force known as cohesion. But it's not complicated, but it's not let's not complicate things and and to surrounding soil surfaces a force known as adhesion so we have cohesion and adhesion uh, and to surrounding soil surfaces a force known as adhesion this creates a surface tension causing the water to form a thick film on the particle surfaces capillary water can flow uphill it is available to plants roots after gravitational water has passed by and as such is a major source of water for plants roots themselves actually have that is the the action of which roots absorb water is by definition capillary action <clears throat> hydroscopic water is a thinner film of water only a few molecules thick which is like capillary water is a attached to extremely small soil particles by virtue of electrical properties. This film is so thin that the bonds between water molecules and soil particles are concentrated and extremely hard to break. Roots cannot absorb it. Therefore, but this film roots can absorb it. Therefore, but therefore, but this film of water it's critical to the availability of many microbes to live and travel. Oh, so this is water that's specifically for microbes. How cute. Even when conditions are dry, the soil particle surface holds some hydroscopic water. It is impossible to remove it from soil without applying a lot of heat and actually boiling it off. Just about half the pore spaces in good soil are filled with water. The other half are filled with air. Water movement pushes stale air out of out 
and sucks in air from the surface. So adding water means an exchange of air an exchange of air occurs, which is important. If a healthy soil food web is in place, a metabolic activity of soil organisms uses the oxygen and creates carbon dioxide. The presence of carbon dioxide is good is a good sign that the soil contains life. However, the carbon dioxide must be exchanged with fresh air to keep life going. Oh, that's I did not know that's a fascinating. In some soils, the pore spaces are cut off in lots of places, and air is not exchanged when water flows. In fact, water may not flow at all. These soils have very poor porosity. That is, the lack of adequate space between the soil particles. All the oxygen in the soil can be used up by aerobic metabolic activities, resulting in an oxygen-less anaerobic conditions. Organisms that can live in such conditions often produce alkaloids, alcohols, that says alcohols, A little alcoholics in your soil there often produce alcohols and other substances that kill plant roots. Well, by golly gee. So, me, oh, soil profiles and horizons. Soils are exposed nonstop to the forces of weathering. Rain, for example, will cause some soil minerals and organic matter to leach out as water moves down through the soil. This material may hit an impervious barrier and become concentrated in a certain zone or layer. The, side of, the size of particles may cause a particular mineral to be concentrated or to be filtered. Eventually, over time, distinct layers and zones of different minerals are formed. These can be seen like rock strata in the Grand Canyon walls. As you dig down through the soil, a soil profile is a map of the layers or horizons. Soil profiles and horizons. Soil scientists have attached a letter of combi or combination of letters and even numbers to each horizon that appears in any particular soil profile. For a gardener, thankfully, the top horizons, the O and A, are really the only ones that count. The OI horizon contains organic materials that can still be specifically identified with a bit of training that's beyond the scope of this book. This is fabric soil. The OE horizon has experienced more decay and while materials are identifiable as pl a plant matter, you cannot tell which specific plants are involved even with training. This is humic soil. Finally, the OA horizon is where the organic material has decomposed so much that you cannot tell its origin. It could be from plants or from animal matter. This is sporadic Separate, separate soil. All this is somewhat useful information if you want to know if your soils will create more decay byproducts like nitrogen. Decay byproducts like nitrogen because the process that converts the soil into humus isn't complete. Or if your soil has been decayed to the point where it basically just houses microbes that causes decay. Yeah. A, a, the A horizon lies under the O horizon where humus particles accumulate as water runs through the O horizon above and pulls organic particles downward. Water flowing through the horizon carries lots of dissolved and suspended materials. This A horizon has, a high, has the highest organic content of any of the soil horizon and the highest biology activity. This is where the roots grow. This is where the roots grow. Several other soil horizons follow and eventually follow and eventually bedrock. You will need a backhoe to trench through all the horizons under your yard, something that is clearly not worth the effort. Often one or more horizons are missing, worn or transported away by weathering forces. And just as often as it is hard to see any distinction between them, and just as often it is too hard to see any distinctions between layers. The important thing is to make sure your gardens and yards have good soil. 
the proper mixture of materials, organic matter, air, water, and the top layers in the area where plants grow. If not, you will have to add what you do have or replace it entirely. skip a page. I think I am skipping a page. Nope. Okay. <clears throat> soil color. Color can be an easy indicator of what is in your soil as soil color is sometimes dependent on the soil specific mineral and organic components. Weathering, oxidation, reduction actions of iron and re reduction at re Reduction actions of iron and manganese minerals, and the biochemistry biochem of the decomposition of organic matter are the primary factors in factors influencing soil color. Organic components in soil are very strong coloring agents and produce dark soil. These can accumulate or can dissolve a coat and coat other particles of soil with black color. When iron is a component of soil, it rusts, and soil particles are coated with a red yellowish tint. When manganese oxidizes, it oxi oxide is a major component of soil. Its particles take on a purple black hue. These the presence of these colors usually indicate good drainage and aeration. Gray soils can indicate lack of organic material. They also often indicate anaerobic conditions because the microbes that survive in such conditions often use the iron in the soil, rendering, the color, re rendering it colorless in the process. Similarly, magnesium is reduced to colorless components by other types of anaerobic soil microbes. <clears throat> Soil scientists use color charts to identify, compare, and describe soil conditions for the gardener. However, color plays less of a role for us. Good soil is is the color of dark coffee, again, mostly because of its organic components. Soil texture. Soil scientists describe the size of soil particles in terms of texture. There are these categories of soil texture, sand, silt, and clay. All soil has a specific texture that enables one to judge its pro propensity to support a healthy soil food web and thus healthy plants. Soil texture has nothing to do with composition. If you think the term sand applies only to quartz particles, for example, you would be wrong. True, most sand par particles are miner mineral quartz, but all sorts of rock can be weathered into sand. Uh, silicates, field spars, potassium aluminum salt silicate, sodium aluminum silicate, and calcium aluminum silicate, uh, iron and gypsum, calcium sulfate. If the sand comes from from ground up coral reefs, it is limestone. Most silt particles too are mineral quartz, only they are much smaller in size than those found in sandy soils. And silt can have some non-quartz constituents as sand. Blah, blah, blah. Most silt particles, too, are mineral mineral quartz. Only they are much smaller in size than those found in sandy soil. And silt can have the same non-quartz constituents as sand. Okay. Clay, on the other hand, are made up of an entirely different group of minerals. Hydrous aluminum silicates, which are with other elements such as magnesium or iron occasionally substituting for some of the aluminum so the key points so the key point for gardener is that texture has to do with the size of particles only not the composition of these particles what size what size particles then constitu constitu constitute sand silt and clay Start with sand. You're undoubtedly been you've undoubtedly been to the beach and know that sand particles can be seen with the naked eye. They range in size from 0 0.0625 to 2 millimeters in diameter. Anything much bigger has far too much space between individual particles. 
to be of any use to gardeners except as gravel or for a path. <laughs> Sand particles are just small enough to hold some water then when aggregated man am I reading that right sand particles are just small enough to hold some water when aggregated but most of it is gravitational water and readily drains out leaving lots of air and only little capillary water Moreover, the particles of sand are big enough to be influenced by gravity and then quickly settle to the bottom when mixed in water. As to soil, as to texture, soils with large proportions of sand in them are gritty when ground between fingers. <clears throat> okay, good description. Next in texture size is silt. Sand particles can be seen with the naked eye, but you will need a microscope to see individual silt particles. Like sand, these consist of weathered rock, only much, much smaller in size. Only much, much smaller in size, between 0.004 and 0 0.0625 uh, millimeters in diameter. The, the pore spaces between silt particles are much smaller and hold a lot more capillary water than sand does. Like sand particles of silt are also influenced by gravity and will settle out when put in water. Texture of silt when rubbed between figures is that of flour. Clays are formed during intense hydrothermic activity or by chemical action. That of carbonic acid weathering silicate bearing rocks. Clay particles are readily distinguished from silt but at the same time, an electron microscope is needed. These particles are that small, the smallest that make up soil. 1.004 millimeters across or less. This is because clay particles absorb and hold lots of water, which is why they are known as hydrous silicate, hydrous silicate compounds. Because silicon, they contain... because Sil silicon they contain water and often aluminum magnesium and iron as well for comparison let's put things into a more familiar perspective if a clay particle were the size of a marigold seed a silt particle would be a, a large radish and sand grain would be a large a large garden wheelbarrow wow Another way to look at soil texture is to visualize a gram, about a teaspoon worth of sand spread out one particle deep. This would cover an area of the size of a silver dollar. If you were to spread out an equal amount of clay, one particle thick, you would need a basketball court. And some of the sand surrounding and some of the stands surrounding it at that. Wow, what difference does texture make the size of the particles has everything to do with their surface area and the surface area of the pore spaces between individual particles clay has tremendous surface area compared to sand silt is in between clay has smaller pore spaces between particles but many more pore spaces in total so the surface area of the pore spaces in clay is greater than silt which is greater than sand. In, in, in condense, incidentally, haha, <laughs> organic matter, you, organic matter, usually in the form of humus, is comprised of very minute particles that, like clay, have lots of surface area to which plants, plant nutrients attach, thus preventing them from leaching out. Humus also holds capillary action. All soils have different textures, but any can be put into a specific category depending on how much sand, silt, and clay sized grains they contain. The ideal garden soil is loam, a mixture with relatively equal parts of sand, silt, and clay. Loam has the surface area of silt and clay to hold nutrients and water. And pore of sand 
to add drainage and help pull in air. Okay, that is loam. Let's go ahead and show you this picture right here. A diagram of soil tech. That is an amazing triangle. I'll screenshot that triangle for sure. Sample your soils. Good garden soil contains 30 to 50% sand. Thirty to fifty percent sand. Okay. And thirty to fifty percent soil and twenty to thirty percent clay, with five percent to ten percent organic matter. You can find out how close your soil comes to ideal loam. All it takes is a quart jar, two cups of water, and a tablespoon of water softener such as a calgan liquid. You also need soil from the top twelve inches of the area you want to be tested, be it your vegetable garden, flower bed, or lawn. Mix each soil sample with two cups of water and a tablespoon of softener. Put it in a jar, close the jar, and shake it vigorously so that all the particles become suspended in water. Then put the jar down and let things settle. After a couple of minutes, any sand particles in your soil will have settled. Settled out. It takes a few hours for the smallest silt particles to settle on top of this sand. Much of the smallest clay sized particles will actually stay in suspension for up to a day. Organics in the soil will flow to the top and remain there for even longer period. Wait 24 hours and then measure the thickness of each layers with a ruler. To determine the percentage of each, divide the depth of thickness of each layer by the total depth of all three layers and then multiply the answer by 100. Once you know the percentage of each material materials are in your soil, you can begin to physically change it if need be. How do you do this? How you how to do this is discussed in the section in the second half of this book. So that will be uh, the second half of the book. There's two parts to this book, a first part and a second part with with uh, 12 chapters each. Soil structure. Individual particle size or texture is obviously an important characteristic of soils, but so but so is the actual shape of these particles. These particles take when grounded together. But so is the actual shape these particles take when grounded together. This shape or soil structure depends on both the soil's physical and chemical pro properties. Factors that influence soil structure are particle or orientation, or particle orientation, amount of clay and humus, shrinking and swelling due to weather, wetting and drying as well as freezing and thawing, root forces, biological influences, worms and small animals, and human activity. Soil structure types or peeds fall into several distinct categories. When you look at your garden soils, you don't see individual particles, but rather aggregates of these particles. The biology in the soil uh, produces the glues that bind individual soil particles into aggregates. As they go about their day-to-day -day business, bacteria, fungi, and worms produce polysaccharides, sticky carbohydrates that act like glue, binding them, binding individual minerals and humic particles together into aggregates. Let's start with bacteria. The slime they produce allows them to stick to particles as well as each other. Colonies are formed, and these two stick together, as do the particles to which the bacteria are attached. Fungi also help create soil aggregates. A group of common soil fungi in the order Glomius grow through soil pores. Glomins coat soil particles like superglue, sticking these particles together into aggregates or clumps. 
These aggregates change the soil pore space, making it easier for the soil to hold capillary water and soluble nutrients and recycle them slowly to plants. Worms produce soil uh, particles in search for food. Individual particles of minimal of minerals and organ organics are ingested and ultimately ex excreted as aggregates. These are so large they are readily identified as worm castings. Consider too the impact of soil organisms as they make their way through the soil. Each group of animals have various body widths. As they move, they create spaces in and between soil particles and aggregates. By way of com comparison, imagine that a bacterium one millimeter in diameter is the width of a piece of spaghetti. Fungal bodies are generally wider, three to five micrometers. Nematodes, five to a hundred micrometers on average, would be the size of a pencil, perhaps uh, even one of those thick ones <laughs> and protozoa 10 to 100 micrometers would be the diameter of an american style hot dog continuing to use our scale soil mites and springtails at 100 micrometers and 5 millimeters would have the diameter of a good sized tree beetles earthworms and spiders 2 to 100 millimeters would have the di diameter of a large trees imagine how each opens up soil particles as they go through their daily activities Finally, electrical charges on the surface of organic matter and clay particles attach each other in addition to chemicals, calcium, iron, aluminum, in, in water solution acting as bonding agents that hold together soil particles. Why are we going over this soil structure stuff? Because soil structure is a key characteristic of good growing conditions. If there is an adequate soil structure, there is ample drainage between aggregates, but also plenty of plant available capillary water. The air circulation necessary for biological activity is sufficient and perhaps most important. If there is adequate soil structure, there is space for soil biology to live. Good soil structure withstands torrential rains, the drying of desert like droughts, herds of animal traffic, and deep freezes. Water and nutrient retention is high. Life in and on it thrives. Poor soil structures result in a lack of water retention and soil collapses under all the and above mentioned environmental and man-made pressures. Little life is in it and the serious reduction of fertility drives people to resort to chemical fertilizers in increasing amounts. It's starting to rain on us again. So we've got granular, blocky, prismic, columnar, planty, single grained, and massive. And we have this image down here, a microscopic view of a fungus growing on a corn root. The round bodies are fungal spores, the threads are fungal hyphae, and the green color is from ditagated glomion. Ditagged glomion the glue that holds soil particles together. Very cool. <clears throat> We've got two more pages and we'll be done. Here we go. Caution exchange capacity. Capacity. All tiny particles, not just humus, carry electrical charges. These particles are called ions. Ions with a positive charge are called cautions and negatively charged ones are ant Anons. A nines. Looks like onions, but with an A. Anions. <clears throat> uh, positively charged particles are electrically attached to negatively charged particles. This is exactly what happens when opposite ends of a magnet attract each other. When a positively charged caution, caton, or k I don't, I'm, I'm butchering that word, attaches itself to a negatively charged anon, the Caution is absorbed by the anon. Even microorganisms in the soil are small enough to carry and be influenced by electrical charges. Sand particles are too large to carry electrical charges, but both clay and humus particles are small enough to have lots of negatively charged anons that attract positively charged cautions. The cautions that are absorbed by clay and humus include calcium, potassium, 
sodium, magnesium, iron, ammonium, and hydrogen. These are all major plant nutrients and they are held in the in by the soil by two components of good soil. The attraction of these cautions to the clay and humus particles is so strong that when a soil when a solution containing them comes into contact the attraction is sustained and only about 1% of the caution nutrients remain in the solution. They are anions in the soil as well. These includes these include chloride, nitrates, sulfates, and phosphates, all plant nutrients. Unfortunately, soil anions are repelled by the negatively charged on clay and humus particles and therefore stay in the solution instead of being absorbed. These plant nutrients are often missed from garden soils as they are easily leached away in the soil solution when it rains or soil is weathered. Nothing is holding them onto the... Oh, so this I think this is what makes things mobile and immobile, the electrical the electrical charge. Oh, this is fun. Uh, why does it matter? The surface of root hairs have their own electrical charges. When a root hair enters the soil, it can change its its own cautions for those attached to clay or humus particles and then absorb the caution nutrient involved. Roots are hydrogen cautions as their exchange currency giving up one hydrogen caution for every caution nutrient absorbed. This keeps a balance of charges equal. This is how plants eat. Huh, maybe it has more to do with electricity than capillary action. That's fun. The place where the exchange of caution occurs is known as the caution exchange site. And the number of these exchange sites measures the capacity of the soil to hold nutrients, or the caution exchange capacity, the CEC. A soil's CEC is simply the sum of positively charged nutrients, nutrient replacements that it can absorb per unit weight or volume. CEC is measured in milligram equivalents per sorb per unit can, uh, equivalents per 100 grams MEQ 100 gram. What the gardener needs to know is that the higher the CEC number the more nutrients a soil can hold and therefore the better it is for growing plants. The higher the CEC, the more fertile the soil. You can order a CEC test to be run by a professional soil lab. Probably OSU does CEC tests. The CEC of soil depends in part on its texture. Sand and silt have a very low CEC because these particles are too big to be influenced by any electrical charge and hold nutrients. Clay and organic particles in part a high CEC to soils because they do carry a lot of electrical charges. The more humus and, to a point, clay presents in soil, the more nutrients can be stored in the soil, which is why gardeners seek more organic in their soil. More organics in their soil. There are limits to a good. There are limits to a good thing. Don't forget that clay particles are extremely small too. Extremely small. Too much clay and too much and too little humus results in a high CEC, little air in the soil, but little high CEC, but little air in the soil because the pore spaces is too small to, and cut off by the clay's platy structure. Such soil is good CEC, but poor drainage. Thus, it's not enough to know the CEC alone. You have to know the soil structure and mixture. Soil pH. Power of hydrogen. Most of us have a basic understanding of pH as a way of as a way to measure liquids to see if they are acidic or not. On a scale from 1 to 14, a pH of 1 is very acidic and a pH of 14 is very alkaline or basic. A opposite and the opposite of acidic. The pH tells the pH tells the concentration of hyd hydrogen ions H and a caution in the solution being measured if you have a lot of hydrogen ions compared to the rest of what is in solution 
the pH is low and the solution is acidic. Similarly, if you have a relatively few hydrogen ions in the solution, then you have a loose solution with a high pH, one that is alkaline. As a gardener, you, fortunately, don't need to know much more about pH. You do need to understand, however, that the entire time a plant root tip exchanges hydrogen cautions for a nutrient caution, the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution increases. As the concentration of H plus goes up, the pH goes down, the soil is increasingly acidic. Things that usually balance out, however, because root surfaces also take up negatively charged anions, usually high, you, using hydroxy OH negative anions as a medium of exchange, adding OH negative to the solution raises the pH, that is, soil is increasingly alkaline because it lowers the concentration of hydrogen plus ions. Fungi and bacteria are small enough to have cautions and anions in their surround in their surfaces electrically holding or releasing the mineral nutrients they take in from decomposition in soil. This too has an impact on the pH of soil. Why is pH a concentration then? We talk about the soil, why is pH a consideration when we talk about the soil food web? The pH concentrates, the pH concentrated by nutrient ion exchanges influence what types of microorganisms live in the soil. This can either encourage or discourage nutrification and other biological activities that affect how plants grow. As important, as important each plant has an optimum soil pH. As you will learn, this has more to do with the need of certain fungi and bacteria important to those plants to thrive in a, P, a certain pH than it does with the chemistry of pH. Knowing your soil's pH is useful in determining what you want to put into your soil, if anything, to support specific types of soil food webs. And knowing the pH in the rhizosphere helps determine if any adjustments should be made to help plant growth. The rest of part one covers biology that lives in the soil. You have to appreciate soil first, however. And that has been chapter two. Let's look at this. I'm here. And those are the CEC measurements. Thank you again, everyone, for coming on and hanging out. That has been chapter two of Team with Microbes. And until next time, like always, don't forget, it's our planet. So planted.